The Capitalist Unconscious, Marx and Lacan by Samuel Tomsick. And this is chapter three, part four. So the last part of um, chapter three. The symptom between truth and jouissance. How did Marx then invent the critical signification of the symptom? In 1966, Lacan frames this invention in the following way. It is difficult not to see that, even before the advent of psychoanalysis, a dimension that might be called that of the symptom was introduced, which was articulated on the basis of the fact that it represents the return of truth as such in the gap of a certain knowledge. I am not referring to the classical problem of error, but rather to a concrete manifestation that must be appreciated clinically, in which we find not a failure of representation, but a truth of another reference than the one, whether a representation or not, whose fine order it manages to disturb. In this sense, one can say that this dimension is highly differentiated in Marx's critique, even if it is not made explicit there. The intertwining of the, the epistemological and the political problematic becomes most evident here. The symptom is the return of truth as such in the gap of certain knowledge. It manifests the incompatibility and conflictuality of truth and knowledge, pointing beyond the field of positive science, which supports, for instance, the medical notion of the symptom. The truth of cognition remains factual and comes in pair with error. Speaking truth, by contrast, disrupts the regime of knowledge by introducing an enunciation that goes beyond the enunciated and uncovers the detachment of the signifier from its seemingly adequate relation to the signified. Consequently, the autonomy of the signifier implies another regime of truth, and this is what Lacan describes as the truth as such, the conflictual rather than the factual truth. This conflictual truth corrupts a specific type of knowledge which strives to constitute the beautiful order, an ordering knowledge of science, but also of certain philosophies, religion, and political economy. This regime of knowledge necessarily excludes the conflictual dimension of truth and affirms the doctrine of truth value, adequacy, facticity, or convention. In this epistemological conflict, we could envisage a particular expression of what Althusser called class struggle in theory, which manifests here through the struggle for a doctrine of truth and knowledge that does not subscribe to the positivistic ideal of scientificity. Herein lies the epistemological and political novelty of psychoanalysis. Analysis came to announce to us that there is a knowledge that does not know itself, a knowledge that is supported by the signifier as such, both truth as such and knowledge that does not know itself are rooted in the signifier as such, pure and autonomous difference. Marx's critique pursues the same line. His invention of the symptom is contained in his correction of the labor theory of value, which equally consists in introducing the triplet formed by the signifier as such, exchange value, truth as such, labor power, and knowledge as such, abstract labor, which does not think, calculate, or judge, as Freud would have put it. Three figures of negativity, which move from the appearance of market rationality to the contradictions in the capitalist mode of production. To these three figures, Marx and Freud added the fourth, the surplus object. Lacan's definition of the symptom points back to its Freudian theorization as a compromise formation, which combines the demands of reality and the demand for satisfaction, to which the unconscious tendency comes down to. The return of the repressed evokes the paradoxical structure of repression that Freud highlighted in his Metapsychology. While initially the psychic conflict appeared to him as a conflict between two heterogeneous instances, his later developments theorized repression in a complex topological and temporal relation, in which repression and the return of the repressed condition one another in a vicious circle of repulsion and attraction. With this, 
Freud moved from the primacy of the instances to the primacy of the relation, which constitutes the repressing and the repressed instance. For Freud, the symptom codifies the demand for satisfaction and the demand for censorship, but the actual conflict is between the insatiable imperative of the unconscious tendency, which uses reality in order to reach its goal, the reality principle is the extension of the pleasure principle, and the subject of the unconscious, or as Lacan rephrases it, between a certain knowledge, representation, and truth as such, the gap between representation and production. In the symptom, the subject comes to protest against the imperative of jouissance. The claim that truth has no other form than that of the symptom will be later described as the Marxian turn in the history of truth, a turn that envisages in fetishism the rejection of conflictual truth from reality. The fetishist disavowal contains a passion of ignorance, which reveals that positive sciences and governing ideologies do not want to know anything of the relation between truth and negativity. The foreclosure of negativity that Lacan detected in the capitalist discourse allows only an abstract truth of the subject and of society. Marx named this abstract truth when he criticized the fundamental concepts of classical political economy, the four building blocks of the capitalist worldview. Opposed to the fetishist passion of ignorance stands the passion of truth, which uncovers the antagonism between truth and knowledge, and which unites unsurpassable thinkers, thinkers that can be criticized, rejected, subverted, but not simply left behind. Marx and Freud founded their sciences on the dialectical contradiction between truth and knowledge, which remains inscribed in the constitution of the object and in the non-teleological movement of history. The fact that the passion of truth aims at the split in the regime of knowledge and consequently differentiates two dimensions of truth shows that this procedure is not simply equivalent to the phil philosophical love for truth which still strives to establish a stable relation between truth and knowledge. Historically, but also logically, psychoanalysis begins with etiology, a theory of causality, which is supposed to explain the emergence of traumatic neurosis and which leaves its materialist mark on psychoanalysis. Freud, in strong opposition to the scientific and cultural spirit of his time, linked sexuality and neurosis and proposed a theory of causality that ranked the signifier in the category of material cause. Unlike a sign or smoke, which is never found in the absence of fire, a fire that smoke indicates with the possible call to put it out, a symptom can only be interpreted in the signifying order. A signifier has meaning only through its relation to another signifier. The truth of symptoms resides in this articulation. Symptoms remained somewhat vague when they were understood as representing some eruption of truth. In fact, they are truth, being made of the same wood from which truth is made. If we posit materialistically that truth is what is instated on the basis of the signifying chain. The sign still represents something for someone, but in doing so, it does not cause anything. The medical notion of the symptom perfectly fits in this register of representation. The signifier, however, represents the subject for another signifier. This autonomous relation is what brings the subject into being, or in other words, in its absolute autonomy, the signifier is the privileged sign of the subject. While the medical notion of the symptom does not presuppose any subject, its critical signification does. Exactly the same move from the sign to the signifier guides Marx's analysis of the commodity form. Reduced to its use value, the commodity is no more than the sign of a physiological or psychological need, rooted in the stomach or in fantasy, to recall Marx's formulation, while as exchange value it is the sign of labor power, a sign of alienation and negativity that traverses the commodity universe. The invention of the symptom demands a double reform, a critical doctrine of truth and a materialist theory of the subject, since the truth of cognition and the reduction of the subject to consciousness perpetuate idealism. 
The Marxian and the Freudian notion of the symptom thus combines two dimensions. One, the epistemological, according to which the symptom reveals an antagonism between knowledge and truth. And two, the political, for which the symptom stands for the introduction of negativity into politics and reveals the foundation of social links in a structural non-relation. In its epistemological value, the symptom subverts the regime of interpretation. It calls for an interpretation that is neither analytical, in the sense that it reconstructs a series of objective historical facts which produced the symptom, nor her hermeneutic, hermen hermeneutic, hermeneutic, which would uncover its semantic and meaningful dimension. The critical interpretation of the symptom can only be dialectical logical. In this way, the symptom ceases to be an enigma that points to some hidden depth or invisible background and is recognized as an interpretation of structural contradictions. As Lacan insisted, the truth as symptom already speaks. The epistemological value of the symptom highlights the exceptional status of psychoanalysis and of the critique of political economy in the modern scientific universe. The reform of the subject and of truth is necessary because science rejects these two central negativity, negativities. Science is an ideology of the repression of the subject. Science does not want to know anything about the truth as cause. You may recognize therein my formulation of Verwerfung? Science thus performs the same operation on the same negativities as capitalism, which offers a particular insight into their structural compatibility. In relation to these two scientific rejections, psychoanalysis and the critique of political economy are an epistemologically and politically organized symptom, which reintroduces class struggle back into theory to remain with Althusser's theses a bit further. In one of the discussions of this problematic, Lacan indicates that the problem of primitive accumulation has its respondent in the register of knowledge. By grounding itself on the foreclosure of negativity, science inaugurates an endless process in the accumulation of knowledge, a structure on which capitalism grounds its infinite circulation, MCM, in which negativity is still represented, albeit in its abstract equality with other commodities and its fetishist form, MM, where negativity is most evidently rejected. The privileged name that marks the break that inaugurates the accumulative regime of knowledge is none other than Descartes. I recall the state of knowledge before Descartes pre-accumulative. With, De with Descartes, knowledge, scientific knowledge, is constituted on the mode of production of knowledge, just as an essential stage of our structure that one calls social, but is in fact metaphysical, and which is called capitalism, is accumulation of capital, the relation of the Cartesian subject to this being, which is affirmed in it, is founded on the accumulation of knowledge. After Descartes, knowledge is what serves to make knowledge grow, and this is an entirely different question than that of the truth. The constitution of this accumulative regime presupposes the scientific repression of the subject, this repression resides in the way Descartes solves the problem of alienation, which he encounters in methodical doubt. How is the structure of the Cartesian cogito associated with the subject of the unconscious and to labor power? According to Lacan's reading, Descartes' deduction of the cogito compromises or comprises two complementary procedures. The construction of the subject of cognition which will lead Descartes from cogito to res cogitans as a basis for grounding metaphysics and science, and the flip side of this process, which reveals the gap between thinking and being in the statement, I think, therefore I am. Lacan exposes this gap by distinguishing the enunciation and the enunciated within the apparently immediate, unified, and self-evident conclusion. The distinction shows that the subject of enunciation does not entirely overlap with the subject of the enunciated, and that the prosopopoeia of cogito rejects alienation, the non-identity of thinking and being, and which rests the thinking substance. Hence Lacan's correction of the cogito, I think, therefore I am. 
The therefore I am is the content of I think. Consequently, the I that thinks is not identical with the I that is. In order to think itself as identity of thinking and being, the I needs to be split. Non-identity is the repressed truth of the Kojido's identity. With the rootedness of identity and the rejection of alienation in the mind, Lacan declares this rejection to be the necessary condition for the inauguration of the accumulative regime of knowledge, which distinguishes the modern episteme from the ancient and the medieval regime of knowledge. The modernity of Descartes lies in the fact that he did not enter philosophical and scientific discourse simply through knowledge, but more importantly, through alienation. This was the true novelty of Descartes' philosophical gesture the suspension of love for knowledge with methodical doubt in which the subject of cognition confronts its own negativity. The hypothesis of a benevolent, truthful, and non-deceiving God, in which Lacan detects the hypothesis of the subject supposed to know, is a fetishist response to the encounter with alienation and a form of the repression of the subject. The subject supposed to know inaugurates a new type of fetishization of knowledge, which replaces its pre-modern fetishization through philia, love. Had Descartes remained with the subject of alienation, he would probably not have inaugurated the accumulative regime of knowledge, because alienation reopens the gap in knowledge and sabotages its seemingly unproblematic growth. Only under the condition of the repression of the subject do knowledge and value appear to grow automatically, without thinking, judging and calculating involved for as soon as knowledge starts to think judge and calculate in other words as soon as an enunciation of truth emerges in its regime the subject reappears in knowledge the subject of the signifier is something scientific knowledge does not want to know about which is why freud's contemporaries dismissed his etiology of neuroses as scientific fairy tale Descartes might have encountered the subject of alienation, but due to its foreclosure, he failed to invent the symptom. Marx's invention, by contrast, is the flip side of the Cartesian project. Its repetition at the opposite end from the perspective of the negativity that he rediscovers in the given social reality. Freud's wo es war sol ich worden equally repeats the Cartesian project by turning it on its head. Despite various readings of the imperative, Lacan constantly insisted that the ick in question is not the thinking substance or the strong narcissistic ego, but the decentralized subject of the unconscious. Where it was there, I shall come into being. Where it was there, I shall come into being is an imperative that orientates psychoanalysis back to back to constitutive alienation. Freud's formula accentuates that the transformation of the subject through alienation, a transformation that is the logical counterpart of reintegration, adaptation, and normalization, departs from an unconscious formation that embodies the insurmountable gap between the subject and consciousness, as well as between truth and knowledge. Far from calling for the abolition of alienation and the decentralized or recentralization of psychic life, the Freudian imperative demands that a subject be encountered in the unconscious formations, which seem to be without a subject. Only through this encounter can the symptom become more than an anomaly that would need to be abolished in order to sustain the functioning of the existing order. The crucial, critical, and materialist point of psychoanalysis and the critique of political economy is thus that they both reach back to the repressed negative foundations of the modern episteme and can, for this reason, be constituted only as sciences of negativity. They abolish the amnesia that the positive and exact sciences imposed upon themselves. Or, as Lacan concisely puts it, the fact is that science, if one looks at it closely, has no memory. Once constituted, it forgets the circuitous path by which it came into being, Otherwise stated, it forgets a dimension of truth that psychoanalysis seriously puts to work. The same claim evidently holds even more of Marx's critique, 
which makes the labor of negativity the privileged object of his critical science and the necessary foundation of politics. The declaration of the symptom as being Marx's invention continues Lacan's polemic with, with the Marxist world, world view and with its reductive identification of the proletarian with an empirical subject. The doctrine according to which the social symptom is a return of the subject as such in the field of economic science additionally exposes the insufficiency of orthodox Marxism. In writing that Marxist theory is omnipotent because it is true, Lenin says nothing of the enormity of the question his speech raises. If one assumes the truth of materialism in its two guises, dialectical, dialectic and history, which are in fact one and the same, to be moot, or to be mute, how could theorizing this increase its power? To answer with proletarian consciousness in the action of Marxist politics seems insufficient to me. Lacan does not question the pertinence of Lenin's statement. Instead, the quarrel concerns the nature of truth and the place of subjectivity in Marx. If this truth is scientific, then it is reducible to knowledge. No invention of the symptom took place, and scientific socialism is merely a variant of the politics of cognition, just as, polit uh, just as political economy and capitalist societies. In worldview Marxism, the symptom and class consciousness are mutually exclusive. If, on the contrary, Marx addresses the repressed truth that supports and traverses capitalistic and scientific modernity, then capital does not contain a positive science, but instead highlights the mistake that a critical theory of capitalism should avoid. While in capitalism, the scientific discourse is mobilized in order to support the fetishist foreclosure of negativity, Marxist politics, Marxist politics, should ground a new form of scientificity on the return of negativity. One of the main goals of the critique of political economy is to show that classical political economy repeats to the two constitutive operations of modern science, and that the actual utopian endeavor lies in the attempt to provide a scientific foundation to the economic subject and to the notion of private interest. Further, in referring to both Lenin and Lucas, Lacan does not simply suggest that class consciousness and revolutionary action are false answers, but that, but that they are insufficient because the subject of value and the truth as cause both imply a radical decentralization of history, which undermines the idea of the progress of consciousness. This critical point is best summarized in the Communist Manifesto, in which history is not defined as the history of class struggle, which would still refer to a trans-historical one, but as a history of struggles, a history of negativity. The multiplicity of struggles leaves no doubt that class struggle is not historically invariant, nor is the capitalist class struggle a simple continuation of previous struggles, but the resolution. Consequently, class struggle as the name for the real of history cannot support its, its centralization, as it unmasks teleological movement as fiction. That the unmasking of the inexistence of history does not anticipate the postmodernist cliché of the end of grand narratives becomes most evident in the change of the class struggle from feudalism to capitalism, which contains a kind of crystallization and radicalization as only in capitalism the class struggle assumes the form of the conflict between two classes. Our epoch, the epoch of the bourgeoisie, possesses, however, this distinct feature. It has simplified the class antagonisms. Society as a whole is more and more splitting up into two great hostile camps, into two great classes directly facing each other, bourgeoisie and proletariat. It may seem unusual that Marx sees in capitalism a simplification of class struggle, since commodity fetishism is its perfect distortion and repression. In addition, this simplification does not mean that capitalism has revealed some essential truth of previous struggles. Quite the contrary, class struggle has no positive existence and cannot be thought independently of its historical deformations, which are bound to different social relations in their fetishization. The class struggle may distort appearances and the 
ideological constructions that foreclose its truth, but it is itself equally distorted by the fetishist semblance. The entire consistency of class struggle is contained in this twofold distortion, and in this respect it assumes the same status as the unconscious. <clears throat> it stands for the very distortion of history, which through its symptomatic formations reveals the dysfunction of the social link. To extend Lacan's claim, the unconscious and class struggle both assume a pre-ontological status. Once introduced, no attempt in ontology can avoid their implications for the science of being. Also, after Marx and Freud, no radical politics can ignore the function of the symptom, which brings together the proletarian and the subject of the unconscious. In his later teaching, Lacan extended Marx's invention of the symptom from the question of truth to the problem of jouissance, which became the crucial problem of psychoanalysis. In this shift, Lacan noted a possible difference between Marx and Freud. I define the symptom as the way everyone enjoys in the unconscious as far as far the unconscious determines it. The origin of the notion of the symptoms should not be sought in Hippocrates, but in Marx, in the link he first makes between capitalism and what? The good old days, what we call feudalism. Capitalism is considered to have all in all beneficial effects because its advantage consists in the fact that it reduces the proletarian to nothing, thanks to which he realizes the essence of man after he is deprived of everything and becomes the messiah of the future. This is the way Marx analyzes the symptom. Of course, he lines up other symptoms, but the relation of this with a belief in man is undeniable. If we stop making man the bearer of a future ideal, if we determine him in every case with the particularity of his unconscious, and with the way in which he enjoys in it, the symptom stays where Marx has placed it, but assumes a different meaning, no longer a social symptom, but a particular symptom. Talking of the displacement from the social symptom to the particular symptom makes the latter Lacan sound postmodern, negating every possibility of the universal, and the main obstacle to this universalism is precisely jouissance, which points back to the irreducible singularity of the unconscious. However, is this really what Lacan argues? Does he not argue, on the contrary, that only the abolition of the faith in man and in the teleological understanding of history, reveals the actual place where Marx situated the proletarian and Freud the subject of the unconscious. Lacan adopted the differentiation between two figures of Marx. The humanist Marx does not conceal his belief in man, and for him the proletarian is still the bearer of a political ideal that envisages social relations without alienation. However, the mature Marx grounded his critique of political economy precisely on the shift that unites the social symptom and the particular symptom. The proletariat is a particular type of the universal, a singular universal which stands opposite to the abstract and false universalism of the general equivalent and the commodity form. The truth represented by the symptom exposes the materiality of alienation, which also highlights the way everyone enjoys in the unconscious. As far as the production of jouissance is determined by the autonomy of the signifier, in the given historical moment, the articulation of labor power and surplus labor, or and surplus, sorry, surplus value. For this reason, the proletariat cannot be simply identified with the essence of man, but is a marker of the fact that capitalism merely imposes an abstract social truth. This is the point of Marx's analysis of the capitalist transformation of labor that Lacan's critique of the humanist Marx neglects to mention. The critique of political economy presupposes the death of man and not the belief in man, and in this respect, Foucault too was wrong to limit Marx's critique to the 19th century episteme. On the contrary, Marx's critique logically anticipates the structuralist project, which strive to bring about the repetition of the modern scientific revolution in the field of language, thinking, and society. The invention of the symptom is possible only after capitalism has changed the regime of social abstractions, which introduced a new form of class struggle. 
In other words, the invention of the symptom is possible only in the regime of abstract freedom and equality. In Capital, Marx reveals a specific deadlock in this universalism, which again addresses the tension between the fetishist appearance and the symptomatic truth. The wage form thus extinguishes every trace of the division of the working day into necessary labor and surplus labor, into paid labor and unpaid labor. All labor appears as paid labor. Under the corvée system, it is different. There, the labor of the serf for himself and his compulsory labor for the lord of the land are demarcated very clearly, both in space and time. In slave labor, even the part of the working day in which the slave is only replacing the value of his own means of subsistence, in which he therefore actually works for himself alone, appears as labor for his master. All his labor appears as unpaid labor. In wage labor, on the contrary, even surplus labor or unpaid labor appears as paid. In the one case, the property relation conceals the slave's labor for himself. In the other case, the money relation conceals the uncompensated labor of the wage laborer. Neither the ancient slave nor the feudal serf can appear as a social symptom because such appearance demands the abstract universality of the commodity form. Commodity fetishism subordinates all social relations to the economic contract, which departs from freedom and equality, whose abstract range and character is determined by property, the buying and selling of labor power and the pursuit of private interest, profit, means of subsistence. This foundation of politics on abstractions that are, articu that are articulated, art articulated <laughs> through exchange replaces the past fetishizations of social relations, the foundation of politics on transference, or the politics of philia, love. The foundation of the social link on philia as the paradigm of relation is most explicit in Aristotle, where the hypothesis of the social relation is grounded on friendship, which supports three possible constitutions, mar monarchy, aristocracy, and timocracy, which the lack of philia gives ground for three social perversions, tyranny, oligarchy, and democracy. In a famous passage, Aristotle compares these constitutions, respectively, to man's love for his children, man's love for his wife, and finally, brotherly love. In this description, the slave appears as at the point where Aristotle seems to encounter the social symptom. Defined as a living tool, the slave cannot be the subject of philia. He cannot be loved, nor can he love in return. Aristotle's definition is supported by the idea that the slave's body and his being overlap. The slave qua tool does not have a body, he is the body, and precisely by not owning his body, he can belong to others who are foremost masters of their own bodies. Aristotle articulates the kernel of the fetishization of the slave but his discussion is countered by the obvious fact that the slave is also a being of logos, a speaking and therefore rational being. Consequently, if, <clears throat> consequently, if philia is universal, the slave should be loved as well. There is no friendship nor justice towards lifeless things, but neither is there friendship towards a horse or an ox, nor to a slave qua slave. For there is nothing in common to the two parties. The slave is a living tool, and the tool a lifeless slave. Qua slave, then, one cannot be friends with him. But qua man, one can, for there seems to be some justice between man, any man and any other who can share in a system of law or be a party to an agreement. Therefore, there can also be friendship with him insofar as he is a man. As a living tool, the slave stands outside the social relation, while as a speaking being, he is within the pseudo-contractual system that makes him a slave. But because the slave does not embody the way in which each individual is constituted as a subject, he cannot appear as a social symptom. The contradiction in Aristotle's discuss discussion concerns the specificity of ancient fetishism, which culminates in the argument argumentative effort to naturalize slavery. 
The difference between the slave and the proletarian first appears in Roman law, where the proletariat is defined as the class whose social contribution consists entirely and exclusively of their body in the reproduction of their class, thereby creating offspring. Future Roman citizens who will do military service or give birth to new proletarians. They produce a new population which will colonize the conquered territories and help spread the empire. From here, Marx will adopt his definition of the modern proletariat as an industrial reserve army, in both meanings of the term, reserve army and unemployed population. However, this already implies an important shift because the Roman proletariat makes its social contribution in a different sense. Since it hardly possesses any property and cannot be taxed as other Roman citizens, its social contribution is identified with its body and its capacity to produce other bodies. The proletarian's body no longer over overlaps with its being, so the fetishization changes. But he too cannot become a social symptom for the very same reason as the slave. At the other end of history, commodity fetishism abolishes the foundation of social relations on the fetishization of persons. The industrial capitalist does not fetishize the laborer as a producer of value, but the product as the embodiment of surplus value. For this reason, we would need to correct the claim that Marx fetishizes the proletariat. In fact, he defetishizes commodity, which then reveals the double status of labor power in the commodity universe. In any case, the necessary condition for Marx's invention of the symptom lies in the rootedness of fetishization exclusively in the abstract universality of the general equivalent. Only in capitalism do we encounter the conditions for the articulation of universalism and of the social symptom, which makes the proletarian appear as a free subject. Finally, Lacan's discussion of Marx's invention of the symptom emphasizes that the symptom introduces an epistemological break with medicine. In its understanding of the notion, medicine still departs from what it recognizes as the normal functioning of the body. This, the symptom would signal the corruption of equilibrium, which supports the preservation and the survival of an organism. In his tendency towards the scientific foundation of the unconscious, Freud adopted this model for explaining the functioning of the mental apparatus. But already the first symptom he dealt with sabotaged this attempt. In an early discussion of hysteria, Freud makes the following observation. I, on the contrary, assert that the lesion and hysterical paralyses must be completely independent of the anatomy of the nervous system. Since in its paralyses and other manifestations, hysteria behaves as though anatomy did not exist or as though it had no knowledge of it. The symptom rejects scientific knowledge, and hysteria does not want to know anything about anatomy. The discovery of the unconscious amounts to the introduction of enjoying substance, as Lacan puts it, a substance irreducible to res extensa and to res cogitans. The empirical materiality of the body and the subject of cognition, which is everything that the scientific discourse can admit without encountering its own inconsistency. The hysteric symptom, by contrast, is objectivity and materiality that entirely depends on the causality of the signifier. When Freud reads the symptom in relation to symbolism, he necessarily encounters his social value. The hysteric is no less a social symptom, and Freud's later insisting that there is something like a cultural co discontent implies that the particular symptom cannot be detached from the social structures, and that, strictly speaking, there is no such thing as private symptom, no symptom that would not be supported by the same structure as the social link. Medicine uses the symptom in order to produce knowledge that comprises both diagnostics and the progno prognostics. The symptom enables the detection of the illness and its future prevention. For Marx and Freud, the symptom has a merely diagnostic import because it no longer refers to the production of knowledge, 
but to the unveiling of the truth of the actually existing social relations. More precisely, the symptom for both addresses an underlying inexistence. Inexistence is the very consistency of the symptom since this expression, which appeared with Marx, obtained its value. In the principle of the symptom is the inexistence of truth, which the symptom presupposes despite marking its place. The symptom attaches itself to a truth that no longer works. We can therefore say that none of you are foreign to this form of answer, just as no one else is who exists in the modern age. Lacan's theory of discourses, which finally systematizes the homology between Marx and Freud, proposes a formal and a critical tool to think the material consequences of this inexistence and examines the various aspects of discursive change from a structural point of view. The theory of discourses is indeed a structuralist theory of revolution, which unites the epistemological and the political signification of the term and thereby contains an effort to think together the structural and the historical dynamic.